Uh, I'm Nick Daniloff, and I'm here to talk about uh, this recent book, which I published, which is uh, about Chechnya's effort to separate from Russia and become independent. Now, to get into this, let me just say that uh, in my life and in the life of our family, 1917 is overwhelming. Overwhelming for my father because that was the year the communists began to steal his country, Russia. Overwhelming for my grandmother because it forced her into uh, exile uh, and into being a refugee first in France and finally in the United States. As you probably know, grandmothers are very important in children's lives. And so in my case, my grandmother, my Russian grandmother, was really more important to me than my father. And she imbued me with an interest in the Russian language, and an interest in Russian history, and an interest in Russian literature. So as time went on, after I graduated from college, I ended up as a copy boy at the Washington Post. And uh, on one occasion, one of the editors said to me, Danilov, you know, with your background, you should go to Russia and describe the Cold War to the American public. So uh, I did eventually go to Russia. And this book is, uh, in a sense, a product of something like 10 years working in Moscow during uh, the Cold War in the 1960s and later in the 1980s. Now, as you know, um, in 1991, the Soviet Union began to fall apart and its various ethnic republics began declaring their independence. And not surprisingly, Chechnya, which is an ethnic republic in the south of Russia, decided that it also wanted to become independent. Chechnya uh, has been part of the Russian Federation for about 400 years. The Chechens are a very distinct group. They don't speak Russian principally. They speak Chechen, which has no relation to Russian as a language. They are Muslims, by and large, and they have grated under Russian rule for 400 years. So when the Soviet Union began to fall apart in 1991, they struck for independence. They declared independence in November of that year, and Boris Yeltsin, who uh, was the leader of the Soviet Union, basically said to them, take as much sovereignty as you can manage. And they took that as meaning that we also can become independent, we won't be prevented from being independent, and we will rule ourselves. They ruled themselves uh, for a while, but they did not really have adequate resources. The population of Chechnya was about one million, and in that one million population, they had a number of very interesting and able people, but not a sufficient pool, I would say, to be able to run their affairs uh, in a seamless and uh, peaceful manner. Chechnya became a center of freebooting, of carpetbaggers, uh, of basically um, dis, uh, disruptions. And Yeltsin finally, in 1994, decided something had to be done about it, that Russian constitutionalism had to be reimposed. So he <coughs> sent a force of uh, young soldiers in armored personnel carriers and in tanks into the center of Chechnya, where the Chechens very easily picked them off and won that first battle against Russia. It ended in 1996 in an agreement called the Hasav Yurt Agreement, uh, which basically said that we will disarm, we will think about exchange of prisoners, we will try to reconstruct the damage that has been done, and we will settle on Chechnya's future political status uh, by the year 2001. Now, <clears throat> what happened next? 
Chechnya again fell into um, disorder. Aslan Maskhadov, who was the chief military operator in Chechnya, was elected president of Chechnya in the only free and fair elections uh, to that date, and that was in January of 1997. And his desire was to create a secular, independent country which would have good relations with the Russians. But again, as I say, the pool uh, of able administrators, the lack of solid institutions, again led to situation of uh, disorder. In Moscow, Yeltsin suddenly resigned at the end of 1991. Putin, who had been acting prime minister, became acting president with elections in the offing. Simultaneous with that, apartment buildings started blowing up. And there is a good deal of suspicion and some evidence that it was the Russian secret services who were behind the blowing up of these apartment buildings. And in the fall, uh, in September of 1991, Putin, as the acting president, said that he was going to solve the terrorism problem. And he issued those famous words, which were, we will pursue the terrorists everywhere they are. And if necessary, we will drown them in the shithouse. And that phrase really struck a chord with the Russian people. And basically, the mood was, let's go get them. The Russian military then began the second war against the Chechens, uh, using terrifically powerful weapons, bunker-busting bombs. And I think what appalled me so much was that they used anti-personnel bombs, mines, some of which were designed as children's toys. And children would pick these up, and it would blow their arms and legs off. And I think that can be characterized as state terrorism. In any event, Maskhadov rallied a group of fighters. At most, they were said to be about 5,000. And they engaged in a war against a modern military sent by the Russians. And it went on from um, it went on from August of 1991 until about 2008. All the time, Maskhadov was seeking to build a secular uh, government, and in order to try to uh, improve his chances, he sent this man Ilyas Akhmadov out to the west as his major. Uh, is that telling me to shut up? Uh, as his major um, representative. They communicated, uh, not directly, because the Russians were always going to monitor their telephone conversations. They communicated by audio tapes, micro audio tapes, I might say, that were spirited out of Chechnya to the west uh, by couriers. And of course, they were directed to this man who responded with uh, videotapes, and also a few conversations by telephone. 24 of these audio tapes survived. And when I learned of that, I decided that it would be a wonderful project to get those audio tapes, to translate them, and then, as a journalist, to interview Ahmadov, uh, which I did by finding him at the National Endowment uh, for Democracy in Washington, DC. And we managed to get a grant which allowed us to translate these audio tapes, which were in Russian and in Chechen, principally in Chechen, by the way, into English. And they're now contained in this book with commentaries by Ahmadov as to what they uh, contained, what the purpose was, and so forth and so on. Well, the end of the story, uh, you probably all know. Um, Maskhadov, the secular leader of Chechnya, was killed in 2005. Ahmadov sought political asylum in the United States. And uh, with his help, we put together this book, 
which was published in December of last year, and which you can all acquire and read and learn about the inside thinking of the rebels in Chechnya. Unfortunately, this is a book which is aimed largely at libraries and at specialists, and to my disgust, it sells for $100 a copy. However, if you go to Amazon, you can get it for $70 a copy. In any event, I'm here and I speak free of charge. Thank you very much. <laughs>